Hey everybody, it is May 14th, 2020. Time's about 11.30 CDT. It's about 69 degrees Fahrenheit out. It is GeoRant time. GeoRant number 123, which I've decided to make a second part to GeoRant 122, which will be linked below. Uh, and the reason being is because I got asked a couple questions about 122. Uh, first question it's about this, and it's on the YouTube channel, so I'm going to address this. I usually don't bandage something like this, but the cut's pretty deep. It's about 1.5 centimeters long, so it's uh, 0.6 inches long. Well, anyway, what happened was we had one of those latches on our folding door, and it's a specialty latch. It's not just like a little gate latch from Home Depot, which probably would have worked better. But it's a specialized thing. There's a lot of pressure behind it, and I've gotten a pit, put a you know, stick your thumb under it and push it open. And I pinched my thumb in there many times, but what I didn't know and I learned the hard way is that there was pressure behind the door. And the top thing within it actually flips up. That has a lot of pressure behind it anyway as it is. And it's just soft plastic. There's no sharp edges. Well, anyways, I stuck my finger under there and I'm left-handed. It's a good thing I used my right hand. Under there, pinched my thumb as normal. So I pushed it up and it went like that. And with that extra pressure behind the door, that flung it up even faster and it cut my finger right open. So that's how this happened. <laughs> so anyway, and it was first thing Monday when I got out of bed to come in back to the office for the first time in a couple of months. But anyway, second question, and this is a good question. If quartz is stable throughout the metamorphic process, and, and especially in something like, you know, a quartzite derived from a quartz arenite, how can we tell how metamorphosed a quartzite is? And that's a really good question because there are a lot of geologists, especially in the Midwest, because almost all quartzites are low-grade metamorphisms. So like zeolite to green, lower green, prenolite to zeolite to prenolite to lower green schist. Not usually more than that. And they'll use the sedimentary protolith names for it, which I don't believe is correct because quartzite is technically a metamorphic rock. But anyway... That's a talk for another time. But the question, you know, question is how do we know? If you just, honestly, if you just have a piece of quartzite in a box, you're not probably not going to be able to tell. Because what happens, although, you know, quartz are night, you know, the grains are usually rounded. We'll assume it's something like the St. Peter sandstone was a protolith. So very rounded, very pure quartz night. As it undergoes heat and pressure, what will happen is some of the grains will interlock and you'll get some sort of interlock in between the grains that causes them to break across grains when you break it open. And that just and that just tells you it's been metamorphosed. All quartzites do this. Uh, it doesn't matter how metamorphosed they are. It's not really a good indicator. You have to, in order to, to really know how metamorphosed a quartzite is, you have to step back. You have to look at where it came from. And there are actually about four ways we can tell other, you know, and like grain alignment. And a lot of quartzites, you'll have coarser grains and they may still have their roundedness, but you gotta be careful. You gotta make sure it's crystal interlocking due to metamorphism and not something like intergross, which are due to like groundwater movement and re-precipitation of minerals. But anyway, grain alignment. As a rock, say the sandstone is just all random you know you just say well, like if you put a bunch of different size marbles on the table and they, and they would just be random as you bring them together first all the pore spaces are going to close and as, if you could compress them even more what would happen is all those pore spaces would be gone and the spheres would get crushed and form a preferred alignment that is secondary to what was depositional. Now, a lot of times, depos you know, a moving stream or something that had pebbles in it will have preferred orientation of pebbles in it that have nothing to do with metamorphism. So, grain alignment can be used, but you gotta be careful with it. You gotta make sure the grain alignment is throughout the rock uh, at a back up scale, not just local, because that just could be preferred orientation from depositional environment, okay? So that's kind of a way, but there's better ways. Um, you can use, actually use, uh, slates, phyllites, and schists c c within the quartzite, because often between the bedding planes or within the lenses within the quartzite will be mudstones, and those get metamorphosed with the quartzite. So you can use those if you have them to get metamorphic facies, and like the Lorraine Formation up in Ontario will often have chlorite in it, uh, so you know it's lower 
its lower metamorphic facies. Um, you will also get what we call loss of primary structures. Now, as sandstones, as sand gets deposited and later becomes sandstone, you'll often see ripple marks in it. Or you could have a little bit of thin silt that actually forms mud cracks in it, but not enough mud in it to actually form a mudstone. So you can use mud cracks or even burrows if it's not Precambrian, you can use those as well. But so the concept is as the rock becomes more metamorphosed, those structures are going to get destroyed. And we see that all the time in mudstones as well. I mean, you can't find a mud crack in an ice. Okay, or, or, or a ripple mark. It's just been metamorphosed so much. You can't, but that only gives you a relative level of metamorphism. If you can't see any primary structures, all you can really say is it's not low metamorphic. It's probably medium or high. That's really all you can say. And the same thing with grain alignment. You know, you can't use it exclusively. The, the muds within is lenses and beds is your, is your first best bet, your second best bet. And the, 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 well, actually, the muds and lenses are your second best bet. Your first best bet is to step back even further because most quartzites, unless there's been extensive erosion, will be bound above or below somewhere in the stratigraphic sec section by a mudstone or a wacky or something like that, something where you can use the index minerals. So in other words, you know, you'll have a mudstone protolith somewhere in there or a wacky protolith somewhere in there where you can use that and if it's a and if it has like say you have a wacky above and a, and a slate below and there's chloride here and there's chloride here you can assume that quartzite in between is is lower 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 metamorphic so like zeolite or prehnite facies someone like that maybe lower green schist but anyway okay before this gets too long it's already seven minutes i'm going to go over the rest of this most of you saw this in 122 it is in here, so I'm not going to go over it as plates one and two. Uh, but what I did was I have an abstract that explains the plates. That's all it does. This is short and simple. Here's the references, so they are in there now. Yeah, that's what I just showed you, plate one, plate two. But here's plate three, okay? So what are we looking at here? Well, it's just in two parts so it wouldn't get overcrowded. This is your metamorphic facies chart. Um, Increased pressure, increased temperature. Same thing on both of them. The only reason why I did two is so it wouldn't be so busy. This one has the facies names on it. This yellow here, lithification, diagenesis, this is not metamorphose. This, this, is, this is sedimentary, and I actually mentioned that in the abstract. So, you know, that's not it. So basically from here, going this way, you get increased heat and pressure, increased metamorphism. There's the facies names down here. Oh, wait, before here, you see you have... Andalusite, kyanite, sulmonite. Those, as I mentioned before, are trimorphic. So if you, you will have one of the three in your rock, but not all three without mitigating circumstances that I've talked about before. So you can use those to get a general idea of your environment. And then these are pathways, and they're actually more, you know, like zones. I just did them as from the center line. And this is your typical continental shelf or continental acratonic setting. And you go from, you know, a mudstone like a shale to a slate to a schist or to a phyllite to a schist to a gneiss to a migmatite. So you go from your mudstone to slate to phyllite to schist to gneiss to migmatite. Then melting occurs again. There's also a line on here for wet granites, uh, granites with a lot of... Uh, uh, water to them will melt sooner, pushes the melting curve towards the cool end. So they'll melt before dry granites will. So I included that on there. So that's that chart. That's plate three. Plate four, here we have the concept of nodes. And in 1955, in the Upper Peninsula is where this concept was developed. And we have nodes here. You see there's three. They are named. I'll get into this in a second. But the con this is my own drawing. I still have to put the right map view on here. A scale isn't necessary or north arrow because it's an example. But basically, the concept of a node goes like this. When something gets metamorphosed, unless it's contact metamorphism, it's going to be regional or semi-local. You're not just going to have point metamorphism. 
okay? So you'll get these zones. And here the white, this is a map view. The white, and there's a fault here. It's just an example. It's unmetamorphosed. So as I get towards this red igneous intrusion, which is not part of the node, uh, as I go from here, I hit this isograd. And this is where chlorite, in this case, first appears. And then my chlorite zone. I hit the second isograd. That's where my biotite appears. And then I have my biotite zone. And then garnet, and then kyanite, and then the purple's contact metamorphism, then my red igneous intrusion, which is not metamorphosed. This whole thing, minus the igneous intrusion, is my metamorphic node. Okay, so that's plate four. Plate five is... The Upper Peninsula, with the three dominant regional metamorphic nodes in it. Now, Wisconsin's there, North Arrow, I do have a scale here. And then I have this down here, which goes from low to high metamorphism. And then you have your index minerals, okay? And then your isograds, which are the lines that separate them. And these are the zones, okay? These colors. Now, basically, what you have in the Upper Peninsula is you have your core. You have your old Precambrian rock, which is generally two billion years and older, okay? And that's where your metamorphism has occurred, mostly due to the 1.8 billion year old Pinocchio and orogeny is when most of these formed. And um, I shouldn't say more than two billion years old, about 1.85 billion years old is the age of most of these, or older is the age of most of these Precambrian rocks where nodes occur, okay? Then, at 1.1 billion years ago, and after the Pinocchio orogeny that formed these nodes, we had the mid-continental rift deposits, which are volcanics with, topped with clastics, and that cross-cuts the whole thing. It's younger. That's the, uh, so all cross-cutting relationships in action right there. Then we have even the younger, about 500 million years or so, or younger, Paleozoic, rocks here. I did not include the glacial stuff because it's so thin compared to the rest of the stuff. It's not worth mentioning. But those are actual nodes in actual space on Earth in the Upper Peninsula. This, plate four, is just a concept. It's the concept of nodes. So anyway, this is getting long. I think I'm going to cut it off there. This will eventually be on the website, okay? Uh, and I love this picture. This was taken in the Grenville province, just east of the Grenville Front, east of Sudbury, Ontario. And here you can see we have, I forget, this is a nice, I forget, and I, I forget if it's borderline schistos or not, but you can see the foliations. It's almost vertical. I also forget what the protolith is. I forget if it's igneous or if it is uh, sedimentary. And then here you have this cross-cutting vein in it. Uh, oh, and I forgot to... Uh, mention too when we're talking about these and we're using and, and we're using these metamorphic index minerals we're assuming the protolith is a pellitic i hate that word so i just use mudstone is a mudstone of sedimentary origin and not igneous because these index minerals in here like biotite quartz uh garnet <laughs> these muscovite these can cool out of a magma Okay, so we're only dealing with metamorphic rocks here and metamorphosed mudstones, all right? Because you're not going to have big crystals of biotite in a clay. It's just not going to happen. You only get that, or garnet. You're only going to get that if the mudstone has been metamorphosed. So this does not include protoliths that are igneous, okay? Anyway... This is past 13, coming on 14 minutes. By the way, that's it. If you have any questions or comments below, please leave them. And I hope you learned something.